Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Isaiah Sagala. I am the UTA AIS president uh, for our chapter here. And joining me today as another student moderator is Patricia Moriel. She is the uh, president for our UTA NOMAS chapter, the uh, National Organization for Minority Architecture Students. Uh, last year, we did a collaborative event on the topic of equity and diversity in the profession. And this year, uh, or excuse me, this semester rather, uh, we decided the topic that we would collaborate on is alternative career paths in architecture. And as we'll find out, uh, with your architecture education, there's a wide variety of things that you could get into outside of just purely architecture and design. Uh, so I want to extend some thanks to our NOMAS collaborators for helping us put on this event. Uh, but without further ado, let me go ahead and introduce our guests here today. So first we have Kate Aoki. And is that pronounced correctly? Great. Uh, Kate is an architect and the head of exhibition design at the Dallas Museum of Art. She graduated with a bachelor's degree in textile design from the Rhode Island School of Design and a master's in architecture from the University of Texas at Arlington. She started her career working at the Dallas Museum of Art and later embarked on an architecture career path, working for firms such as Good, Bolton and Farrell, Morrison, Dilworth and Walls, JHP Architecture, Urban Design, and most recently as Senior Associate at DSGN, which was awarded the 2020 Architecture Firm Award from Texas Society of Architects. She has served on several art and architectural committees, as well as studio and design award juries. She serves on the board of the AIA Dallas Architecture Forum and is the executive committee and the executive committee of Dallas chapter of the AIA. Her husband, Brent Mitchell, is head of collections and exhibitions at the Modern Art Museum of Fort Worth. They live with their feisty seven-year-old son, Holden, in Dallas. Well, that's uh, pretty unique, uh, you know, reading that, and I'm sure all of you think so as well, that we have an exhibition designer in Dallas and then uh, head of collections in Fort Worth. So that's a great pairing. Thank you, Kate, for joining us. Uh, next up, we have uh, Timothy Logan, who is an application developer and computational designer for HKS and the Laboratory for Intensive Exploration uh, Studio. His work with LINE has balanced the concerns of design, documentation, and fabrication for complex architectural systems and custom application development from the scale of project-specific needs to needs of the office at large. He also leads development and contributes to open source projects such as ELK, a mapping and topography plugin for Grasshopper and Dynamo, as well as a number of other projects within the AEC space. Uh, you know, I, I must say for myself and those uh, other students in the audience who perhaps haven't used it yet, I've been an avid user of ELK ever since uh, it was introduced to me. I think it was my third year. Uh, there was a, a guest uh, professor from the, also HKS line, his name was Zach Potts, and I, I assume he worked closely with Tim and he int me, introduced me to that software. And trust me, that's the number one topography and mapping software that you want to use. Uh, especially in Oregon and Rhino. So big cheers to Tim for having uh, developed such a project. And thank you, Tim, for joining us this, this evening. And last but not least, we have Lorena Toffer, who is an architect, educator, and social entrepreneur. At present, she is the lead educator for the architecture and interior design at DISD Career Institute East. She is founder and past president of the City Lab Foundation and co-founder of City Lab, the first Dallas ISD transformation, excuse me, transformation high school with a design focus offering architecture, urban planning, and environmental science in downtown Dallas. She holds a bachelor's and master's degrees from Tecnologico, Tecnologico de Monterrey and Texas A&M University, and is an AIA National Young Architect Award and award recipient for exceptional leadership and significant contributions towards diversity and inclusion. A practicing architect with 15 years of experience, she has been adjunct assistant professor at UTA Kappa. She is a graduate of AIA Dallas Advanced Leadership Program and recognized as ENR's Young Professional NSBE DFW's top STEM influencer, Greater Dallas Planning Council's Mark Good Urban Pioneer, the Lynx Foundation, Women who steam and is an outstanding alumnae 
alumnus of Texas A&M College of Architecture for Leadership and Humanitarian Approach in our field. So thank you, Lorena, for joining us. And without further ado, I'm actually going to hand off uh, our first question to uh, our other moderator, Patricia. So Patricia, if you don't mind taking it away. Of course. Thanks, Isaiah. So my first question that I have is, what do you currently do in your position and where are you working? Um, Isaiah gave us a bit of a glimpse of that, but if you could maybe elaborate, that would be amazing. And Tim, yeah, let's go ahead and start with you. Uh, sure. So, yeah, like Isaiah said, I work with HKS, which is a, a pretty large architecture firm uh, that's headquartered in the Dallas area. Um, I think my, my official job title nowadays is senior computational designer, which probably means different things to everybody. Um, uh, and my unofficial or semi-official title, I'd say, is computation director for the Line Studio, which is our, our small cross-sector design team uh, that gets to work on a lot of different projects. So most of HKS, just because of the size, tends to work on specific sectors. So if you work in healthcare, you just work in healthcare. Um, if you work in sports, you work in sports. Uh, and there, there's some cross-pollination, but that's kind of largely the way it works. But as a design studio, we're a little bit odd because we, we sort of hop around and go to different uh, sectors and, and help out on work on different projects. Um, but my role these days tends to be a little bit more on the, the mentorship and, and sort of guiding younger computational designers, which are just people trying to leverage the ideas of computational thought and, and sort of thinking and, and leveraging computers for uh, the sake of influencing design and fabrication and delivering an architectural product. So we're just using computers to help make our jobs easier or to deliver design intent that wouldn't otherwise be possible. And then sort of larger overall is just trying to think of strategies of, of how we can better leverage technology within the office at large and, and sort of trying to strategize at that level too. And perhaps Tim, if you don't mind elaborating, but I, I believe it was the Lion Studio that had a big part in one of the pavilions in a, in a recent park that was constructed here in Dallas. Do you mind sharing how Lion and, and or yourself was involved in that? Sure. So that was the the Pacific Plaza Pavilion that's that's actually in the park that's right next door to our headquarters that used to be a surface parking lot for years. Um, so Parks for Downtown Dallas uh, contracted SWA to, to do the park there and SWA contracted us to do a small pavilion. And I think at one stage early on, we had basically tried to take over the park and make it one giant pavilion that was like spanning across the entire thing. And they told us to slow down a little bit. Um, and eventually we, we settled on trying to find the right elements to try to attach the pavilion to, because it wasn't really planned explicitly in the design of the park. Uh, and we kind of latched on to the, the concept of the knoll, uh, this sort of small hill that they were, were building into it. And we wanted to try to build around that. So we built this uh, elliptical pavilion that, that sort of circles around that, that space. And the park itself gets its name from the Pacific Railway that used to run through. Uh, it no longer does, but it was one of the first railways that went from California to, to Louisiana that like really sort of spanned the country early on and ran through Texas specifically. The Texas portion of it was th from El Paso all the way down uh, to, to uh, Louisiana, which was their, the sort of connection that was all owned by the same railway company. Um, but there was the history of, of the railway there, even though it was kind of gone at this stage, we wanted to try to tie back into it. So the design was trying to to elicit a little bit of an idea of railway tracks sort of just with the design of the structure at the top of it. And then it was essentially just a shade structure. So to provide the sort of patterning on it, we used American Morse code um, and use that as the patterning across the entire uh, system of the shade, which was a perf metal uh, stainless steel. And uh, it's essentially all the stops that the railway went along from, from California, or, I think it was from El Paso to Louisiana. It was just that portion of it um, that is encoded in, in all the way around the pavilion. Great, thanks for sharing. And for those of you who are unfamiliar with the project, give it a quick Google, or if you live around Dallas, go take a visit and you'll notice the perforations that Tim was talking about, how intricate that they are, and you know the uh, amount of work that goes into the computations to design that piece is pretty significant. So take a look if you haven't already. Uh, Kate, can we hear from you next? 
Sure. So I'm the head of exhibition design at the Dallas Museum of Art, and I'm pretty fresh to this role. So I just accepted the position in December and started work uh, in January, beginning of January. Um, I was fresh off a career that was solely architecture based, um, but with my background in fine arts, I come from a family of artists. Art was something that I was never quite able to fully incorporate into my architecture career that I really missed. And so I had found myself thinking over the years, I had worked at the Dallas Museum of Art previously, if that position ever became available, would I apply for it? And it never, it, jobs like that in the museum industry are, are fairly rare. So I just didn't really ever expect to get the chance. And so when it did come up, I had to apply. Um, I was at a firm at DSGN Associates that I really loved, so I wasn't looking to leave at all. It's just that this was sort of a once in a lifetime opportunity, but it it's really great to be there. So um, what's nice about it is that each project, each ex exhibition is like a mini project. And so it's a really good job for somebody like me with a short attention span, you know, it's, it's very accomplishable goals. Um, you get to see your work much much quicker, you know, you're, we're talking months instead of several years. Um, but I kind of oversee, I, I do design, but I also oversee the design direction of each exhibition. So I'm, I'm the manager for the exhibition graphic designer. So I help oversee the development of the graphic identity, the spatial design, even where the artwork is placed. So the curators largely guide that, but they also want my input as to which pieces should be placed where and adjacent to other pieces. So um, it's it's a pretty cool job. I'm, I'm really enjoying it so far. And I'm finding that my architectural education and, and experience is coming in more than I would have ever expected. So it's been a really great crossover. It sounds like it. And it's exciting to hear how you've been able to find a uh, position or a role that blends these two backgrounds of yours uh, within architecture and the art. So that's very exciting. Um, Loretta, can we hear from you next? Uh, sure. And I'm going to apologize. I have a bird at home. So he just All decided the better. to share his song right now. Awesome. Uh, but uh, um, like you said on my bio earlier, you know, I'm, I'm an educator and I, ha I had been transitioning from being a practicing architect into education. Um, first of all, at UTA, CAPA, so collaborating with several design studios and the uh, design communications courses at CAPA. Um, but now I'm full, you know, in K through 12 edu education, so teaching high school students. And basically I'm their entry point to, you know, discover the profession or discover, um, help them discover a love for either architecture, interior design, urban planning, um, those types of, uh, of careers. So I am, or I like to, you know, define my role as I am a little bit of a leader. I'm a little bit of a role model. I'm also a um, program manager. I'm also a counselor. And for some of these students, I'm their first line of support. And our uh, student body right now is about 110 students that are in the architecture and interior program. Awesome. And it's exciting to have an educator amongst the panel here, uh, especially with more and more conversations coming about, about uh, having a, a pipeline of new emerging professionals. But that pipeline starts all the way back into, uh, you know, as early as you mentioned, in middle school and in high school, where it's important to spark the interest of these young, these young minds, these young students. That way they could pursue uh, something in, in our path, you know, and as we've seen here, the path of architecture can lead to so many other things. So it's important to bring uh, new minds to, to that path. Uh, I'll, I'll, I'll follow up with uh, our next question, which I'm, I'm gonna combine two thoughts here. Uh, the first part of the question is, what were your original aspirations in pursuing architecture? And what was the pivoting point in your career? Did you feel like something was missing uh, whenever you were pursuing solely architecture? Uh, or was there another reason for that pivot? And, and Kate, if we can start with you, which you, you began to allude to it already. Sure, yeah. So my um, my dad's side of the family had a couple of architects in it. And so I grew up as a, as a little kid, I had always wanted to be an architect. And then when I got to college, 
I didn't knew that I didn't have the perseverance to pursue it as an undergrad. So um, I just wasn't ready to commit to that kind of study and the long hours. And so I went into textile design instead. Um, and I, you know, I, what was the first part of your question? I'm sorry. What were your original aspirations for pursuing uh, architecture? Yeah, then yeah. what was the pivot point? Yeah. So after um, working in the museum for a little while, the position that I have now actually did come available at that point and I applied for it and I didn't get it. Um, rather than continue to try to work in the museum doing positions that weren't suited for me, I figured that that was actually a good time to reconsider my architectural education. At that point, I was about 30 years old. So I went back and studied under the Path B, um, or pa sorry, Path A program as a career changer. And it, yeah, it was, it was fantastic. At that point, I had a little bit more maturity in life under my belt to be able to commit to, <laughs> to the long hours. Um, it's funny, when I went into the program, I had this image of <laughs> just sort of, sort of funny, but I wanted to design vacation homes because I figured it would let me travel and work in really exotic locations. I quickly started to shift and understand more of the issues inherent in architecture and how architecture could solve bigger, more urban problems. And so by the time I graduated, I was a lot more interested in looking at um, affordable housing, how I could start to make a difference in my own community. Uh, so that's really what I focused on during the 10 or 11 years that I was in architecture. And by the time I left DSGN, I had built a library, I would built a few multifamily um, affordable housing prototypes, uh, sorry, not prototypes, project, project types. Um, so I was really able to focus on what I thought was important. But like I said earlier, the art piece of it was something that I just couldn't, couldn't fulfill. So, um, you know, it, it was a really good time. This job came along at the perfect time. I felt like I had accomplished a lot in my architectural career. I was really happy with the work that I'd been able to do and, and the effects that I had been able to see in my own community. And so it, it was a nice bow to be able to wrap it up and, and make this shift. Well, what I appreciated there was that, um, you know, for some people who make this pivot, there's like they start in architecture and pivot elsewhere, but it sounds like from your experiences, you had a couple of pivots along the way. Uh, so it, it's exciting to hear how you arrived at your, your position now. It's awesome. I can't sit still too long. <laughs> uh, Tim, I saw an additional guest that was there with you. So that's me. First, can we see who that guest is and can we get your response next? Yeah, let's see if she'll respond. It's my dog. Oh. She, she's, she likes to get attention. When she hears me talking, she knows that like if she's <laughs> obnoxious enough, she's going to get a treat out of it so I can get her to be quiet. So sometimes I just hold her so I don't keep feed, force feeding her treats. Um, smart little one. <laughs> yeah. This pandemic has been great for her. <laughs> oh, yeah. Um, yeah. So, so I would say my pursuit of, of architecture initially was was – was kind of interesting as well. Like I, I actually started off um, going to, to school to study computer science. Um, I had been around computers my entire life. I think I got my first computer when I was like four or five that was just mine to play around with. Um, and when I graduated high school, I, I wasn't really sure what to do, but like I kind of w was good with computers. So I was like, well, I'm just gonna do computer science. Um, so I did that for a couple of semesters and then just like had this like young adult epiphany that like I can't stand in front of a computer for the rest of my life every day and I've got to do something creative and get out there. Um, so I abandoned computer science and started studying music uh, and I did that for a little while and then like the music industry is kind of terrible and I'm also in the middle of Dallas which isn't exactly music central. Um, so after a couple of years of, of that and that was more like on the recording engineer track. Um, I wound up with in architecture school like a couple of years after that even. I was just like randomly taking classes in college because I didn't know what to do with myself. Um, but I thought I thought architecture was going to be a nice sort of bridge between the sort of technology sort of aspects that I was like always sort of around um, and the sort of wanting to do something more creative within my life. So for, for me, like architecture was trying to, to bridge that, that sort of chasm in, in my sort of 
desires as far as a career. And then I would say kind of my pivot point, which which oddly is taking me like way back to technology again. Um, I was I was working at HKS in like early, it was probably like 2007, 2008. And we had had, we were a big company. So we had a, an enterprise agreement with Autodesk, Autodesk to, to, to use their software. And as part of that, they would give us credits for consultancy stuff. Like they would train us or, or do like reviews of things. And we, we never used the credits properly and then they, they would expire. So at one time when that was about to expire again, they, they showed us this, this plugin that one of their new developers had made for Revit that was like an uh, Excel import export tool. Um, and the Revit API was only a few years old at that time and it was kind of a novel thing and it was a needed tool. So we, we traded our credits for it and we got it. And then a few months later, the next version of Revit came out and it stopped working because the API changed and it just broke. Um, and it Autodesk sold it to us as is with no, no support whatsoever. So once it broke, it was, it was our problem. Um, so I decided to try to fix it because I, I like computers and I had done a little bit of computer science, even though it'd probably been 10 years at this stage. Um, and it took me six months to learn enough to be able to fix it, but I finally fixed it. And this is, you know, 2007, 2008 is also the same time period that explicit history comes out. Um, which is better known as Grasshopper these days after it was rebranded. Um, and a lot of people were getting excited about that. And because I had started doing this programming and this visual programming thing came out that the designers were excited about, that sort of like started to move me more in that direction. And then I started just doing that more full time. That's awesome. Thanks, Tim. Yeah. Corinna, let's hear from you. Yeah, so I was originally going to go to chemical engineering. Um, I made my decision to go to architecture uh, very late. I mean, I didn't really, I wasn't aware that there existed a career in architecture. Um, and there was no programs like, you know, the ones that are present right now in a lot of high schools back in Mexico. Uh, so that's probably, you know, now in hindsight, I think that's one of the main reasons why am I so interested in supporting high school students in finding a career because I didn't have that mentor. I didn't have that, um, that pathway during my high school years. Um, but, you know, I was very just mesmerized by a lecture that I, I attended and I joined the program. I didn't know that I was gonna be part of the uh, first um, graduating class from that particular campus in architecture uh, from Tecnológico de Monterrey. So that was a very unique opportunity and it was extremely competitive. I, I you know, it was, um, very, I would say, stressful environment. Uh, it was also, in a way, a cultural adjustment for me. Um, just to you know, it's a very competitive uh, environment, very entrepreneurial, and it's a private university. So me coming with scholarships from a completely different background, it was an adjustment in many different ways. Uh, but I, I fell in love with it uh, from, from the very first day. Um, I figured it was, this was gonna be my, my career uh, for life. So throughout um, moving to the United States to get my master's degree at uh, A&M, again, you know, all the way through finding my first position here uh, in Dallas, I was completely and absolutely in love with, you know, the process of making architecture, of creating space and learning about all of the ins and outs of different uh, typologies. Originally, that was one of my goals. When I decided to become an architect, I wanted to design or be involved with as many different types of um, projects or building types as possible. I did not realize how, uh, in a way, segmented uh, the architecture practice is here in the US, which is in the complete opposite in Mexico. Uh, you can design all sorts of different projects. Um, no matter, you know, you don't need to be part of a specific uh, studio within a firm. So that was eye-opening. And at the same time, while I was practicing architecture, I started volunteering with uh, AIA and again, visiting different high schools. And it was not very uh, present to me or, you know, so evident until much later, uh, how um, my interests really changed. It was, a little bit probably because of, you know, the lack of um, recognition, I would say within the different firms that I was at, 
Um, I was finding more leadership roles all the way to, you know, board positions um, with AIA or different organizations rather than inside the firms that I was working at. Um, so that was, you know, I would say one of the inflection points that maybe realized there, there is a gap. There is not that, um, you know, um, great amount of recognition for minorities in, in our profession at those types of levels, right? When we're talking about promotions and, uh, you know, strong leadership uh, positions within a firm. On the other hand, I really started to become aware of um, how involved and how passionate I was in mentoring our younger staff. It didn't matter what kind of project, what type of studio, whether it was, you know, a small project. Um, I have worked on, you know, very uh, important projects like with the Six Floor Museum, the Dallas Holocaust Museum, and I mean, they're invaluable experiences in my career. But I started noticing that I was becoming much more interested in um, building or helping build a person's beliefs or, you know, um, really seeing them grow than more invested in, uh, you know, the actual uh, product of a building. I was now, you know, becoming more interested in helping build people. So that's when, you know, I really decided to make the change. That's, you know, also one of the main reasons why uh, I was part of the group that helped found City Lab High School to really bridge that gap between our profession, everything that we do, um, and help all of those students find uh, their career. That's awesome. And it's inspiring for me. Uh, now I'm at the end of my architectural education, uh, especially hearing that last part of how you've found a way to incorporate your, your interest for mentorship. I, I, that's certainly something I, I find valuable throughout my time being involved in things like AIS. Uh, so it's exciting to see how you've plugged in uh, to your career through, through mentorship. Uh, and another thing I, I thought was interesting uh, amongst all of our panelists here uh, for all the students or all the people in the audience to recognize is that uh, each of our panelists here, they started in something that wasn't architecture. And that's something that I've noticed amongst some of my colleagues is there is quite a few of uh, architecture students or people who pursue architecture that don't start with architecture, but yet find their way here. Uh, so it, it's great to see how uh, welcoming the profession is to all of these different backgrounds. Uh, before Patricia gets to our next question, or if Patricia has a comment, feel free to add. Uh, I wanted to remind everyone in the audience, I forgot to mention earlier, if you have a question for anyone here on our panel, it could be a broad question to each of them or a specific question to an individual, feel free to drop it in the chat. And then at the end of today's panel discussion, we'll have a Q&A session where, where you'll have a chance to ask that question. Uh, but I just wanted to give that reminder before Patricia takes it away. Yeah, first, um, I actually want to thank Lorena because she was my mentor in high school. Um, so <laughs> she she really helped me and, and pushed me to continue pursuing architecture, even when I had those moments of doubt of, you know, will there ever be, you know, that gap um, that's, you know, not as large and when it comes to just like being recognized and yeah, thank you for the push. <laughs> um, so for the next question I have is, um, how does your education and skill set apply to this new career path? Um, all of you guys have talked about this a bit, but if you, you would like to elaborate, um, we would appreciate that. Um, if not, you could talk about maybe the benefits that your new job has for you. All right, let's start with you. Oh, all right. Yeah, sure. So, um... I forgot the first part of the question, but some of the benefits are, you know, the uh, uh, holidays. I didn't know how taxing being an educator in public schools was. It's, you know, it's incredible the amount of effort and the amount of time, the amount of, you know, mental uh, work that we have to do. Um, even though we are right online in, the, in this new setting. Uh, now add to that, uh, being you know first year teacher through a pandemic, it's definitely been um, quite an experience. So some of the benefits that I found through all of this is that um, getting that, um, I guess being aware and being cognizant of the fact of uh, self-care, 
right? Just as a human being, how we need that time away from uh, work, away from the computer, away from Zoom, especially right now, and really getting that time with, with family and friends, even though if it's, you know, from a certain uh, distance right now. Um, so those were some, some of the benefits. And um, just to elaborate a little bit, I think, you know, it's really made me I was already aware, right, through some of the research we did for City Lab um, to create a school like this and what type of a, a student profile or where, where are the gaps, right, that exist in a public education. But just becoming aware that now we even have to do uh, recruiting or, you know, create a pipeline or do outreach all the way in middle school. So that you know, middle school students can see what architecture design in general could look like. So that when it comes time for them to pick a pathway, um, hours can be, you know, in the top of their list and all of the different options they have as, as schools. Uh, that would be, you know, one, one of the benefits too, that I get to bring all of that expertise uh, into the uh, Career Institute. So students really get to see some of the projects that, you know, I've worked on and, you know, having all of these connections with UTA, with AIA, bringing all of those experts so that the students get to see directly, um, you know, how, how those professionals look like, what do their experience on an everyday basis could look like. And of course, going through this uh, pandemic, they've also become aware of all the changes and challenges that our profession has been going through to be able to create all of the spaces that we do. You know, Lorena, you actually, I think, did a good job answering the other part of the question that you uh, that you had forgot or didn't hear correctly. Uh, it was, uh, how did your education or your architectural education and skill set apply to the new career path? And I think you did a good job of explaining that, you know, by accident almost. Uh, so thank you. Uh, Kate, can we hear from you next? Yeah, I. Um, there's so much direct crossover with my new position, just in terms of um, conceptualizing space and understanding, again, these are like tiny mini architectural projects. So, um, you know, I still have to think about circulation, even code ADA kind of requirements and things like that. So just knowing how to, um, sorry. Um, yes. <laughs> she's like, she's like Tim's dog. Uh, <laughs> just knowing how to approach those kinds of issues that come up. Um, I, I, you know, I'm, I'm an outsider to exhibition design, so I don't know what that education is like. All I can speak to is how things were done before I got there. And I, it was a very, it was a totally different approach where they look at everything from the plan down. There are elevations, but it's all looking in two dimensions. And so I've brought in um, SketchUp views. I've brought in just this element of three-dimensional thinking that they weren't used to. And it's really a funny experience because they it, it's just a totally new thing for them. So I think that that understanding of how architecture is 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 thought about, how to understand building building components and materials, you know, all of that has really had a direct impact on my everyday work. Um, and it's just, I, I have to say the benefits are, I'm really glad that I went through my architectural career so that I can appreciate now. I work 35 hours a week. Um, I, it's unbelievable, I'm not billable. I am not required to keep track of my hours. I get a lunch break. It's incredible. You know, I, I cannot recommend it highly enough. <laughs> so, um, that does yeah, sound awesome. It's yeah, it almost feels like retirement or something. I I really love the work and I get time off. It's crazy. So, um, yeah, but everything that I have done up until this point is directly um, all of my skill sets are used. It's just like the intensity to which I use them is not quite as highly highly defined. See, awesome. Tim, let's hear from you. Uh, yeah, so I mean, I think as far as is sort of transfer of skill set, I think surprisingly a lot of like the sort of different pieces that I've kind of my meandering academic attempts have have benefited. 
like I, I was I was thinking like I had this weird epiphany when I was probably in my mid twenties and I was sort of just starting architecture school. And it had nothing to do with architecture. I was just sitting in the middle of a math class. It was probably like trig or something or one of the early math classes for architecture. And like, for some reason, like it had never occurred to me before, but like I had always treated school as like these like discrete little packaged um, classes. And you just sort of go to class, you learn everything you need to learn in that class and then you're done and you go to the next one. And I was, because there's always like a little bit of a review as you sort of go through things. And I was in this class and there was no review. It was just like, you're supposed to know this stuff just do it. And I was like, wait, this stuff is all connected in a weird way. And then I started thinking about how all the other things start connecting. Um, so yeah, I mean, I think a lot of like, whether it's the sort of music production side of things, or, you know, obviously the computer science has been a huge um, benefit for me in, in transferring to architecture and then architecture in general, you know, and, and so solving problems with competing um, requirements oftentimes has been really helpful. And and I, I think I always like to think about music because it was the first sort of experience I ever had with visual scripting. Um, a lot of that stuff sort of gets pioneered in the the music and, and uh, multimedia space, like uh, P Pure Data and, and Max MSP that were developed by this guy named Miller Puckett back in the 80s and 90s were like the first experience I had with that. So when Grasshopper came about, I was like, oh my gosh, this is like working in audio engineering again. It's like patching a, it's like patching a, a, a synthesizer. Um, so I was super excited about that stuff um, and, and sort of how it starts to transfer across um, and gets used in my sort of everyday work. And I think benefit wise, like, I, I feel like early in my career, it was very similar. Like I was, I was doing the, like the 40 hours, like Monday through Friday thing while like all the other designers were like slaving away all day on, on stuff. And now I get pulled into more and more complicated projects, which is, is a benefit as well. Like I get to touch a lot of the really interesting projects that are occurring in the office just because of the nature of the work I do. Um, and that it's not super prevalent in the office still just yet. Um, so I get to work on a lot of cool stuff, but it, it does take a little bit more time these days than it used to, but I, I would still call that a benefit uh, at this stage too. But yeah, I mean, I, th I think it's all like interestingly connected if you sort of search for the threads. Right, right, that's awesome. Well, this next question that I have for our panel, it, you, you can kind of interpret it in a couple of different ways. The question is, what have the challenges that you faced been while, when making this shift? And Perhaps, and you, you could let me know what your thoughts are here, perhaps there were no challenges when making this shift uh, and it was a pretty seamless transition or perhaps there were some uh, questions that you had about making the, the transition, uh, about how it affects your career path. Uh, so I'd be happy to hear both ends of the spectrum and I'm sure the students would as well as you know, we continue our careers. It's good to hear the good and bad side of things. So. Uh, Tim, if we could start back right around with you uh, in at answering the question, what challenges have there been uh, when making a shift from, in this case, architecture to computational design specifically? Yeah, I think for me early, like it, it's kind of like, it wasn't even like my career path wasn't really a pivot to computational design. It was just kind of a slow drift off to like a tangential architecture right. um, type of work and projects. but. Um, I think, I think a lot of it early on in my, in my sort of transition to more computational space has been trying to find the right place to fit within an office that, that is really focused on design and architecture and, and building buildings and not so much on the technology that gets you there. Um, because I'm not really an architect, but I'm also not really IT. So like trying to find the right spot, especially, you know, early on, there wasn't a line studio for me to join. Um, it was just kind of me tinkering around in the background, trying to figure out what to do with myself. Um, and early on, it was, so, I mean, I think that's one aspect of it. And early on, like when Grasshopper starts becoming prevalent, a lot of the young designers who were excited about that kind of thing would come to me and, you know, we would have these conversations and I would like help them through and we would try to figure out how to do something in Grasshopper kind of together and, and, and. It was, it, was, it was nice to like have people to bounce ideas off of. And as you sort of progress through that and you start going to different levels of the company and you start talking to people that, that don't know anything about the tools that you're using and they don't really care about the technology and why are you talking about rhinos and kangaroos, like just, just do the thing I asked you to do. Um, trying to figure out the right way to, to communicate 
the work that you're doing with people that doesn't really fit in quite with what they're expecting architecture to be was, was I think something that was was more challenging than I expected it to be. Um, so I think those two things were probably the biggest thing and then just kind of the ongoing um, if you're if you're sort of developing digital tools for people in the office to use like the right sort of human computer interface of like how you design something so that someone else will use it and not always ask you to, to, to sort of use it for them kind of thing is, is something that continually interests me and, and something that I keep trying to be better at. Yeah, that's great. Um, Kate, I wanted to turn to you next. Uh, and yeah, I think you've already alluded to it a little bit, how you've actually tried to make the pivot a couple of times, didn't work out the first time, but maybe if we could hear about this most recent uh, pivot and what were the challenges or lack thereof like? Um, the pivot itself was was relatively easy with the exception of the interview process, which was really, um, it's a large institution, the DMA, and, and they wanna make sure that they're making the absolute right decision, which means interviewing. I had interviews, I'm not kidding, with um, maybe 40 people. And oh, I'm wow. not individually 40 people, but there were a couple where it was like 15 or so people in one interview. And so it was a lengthy process, but, um, you know, it's, I, I expected the, my lack of technical knowledge when it came to exhibition design proper to be what would hold me up and that, that would trip me up the most. And it's actually turned out to be understanding the personalities involved in this decision making. They it, like everybody wants to say and just navigating the sort of cultural people waters there is totally not what I expected at all. I, I, I'm lucky because I really like people and I really like that process, but I went in with, with my mind sh shifting in a different way. I just wasn't expecting that. So I tripped up a couple of times. I've had to apologize to a couple of people. Um, I'm finding that architecture is a much more straightforward type of communication where you're telling people how it is, how it's gonna be, and like, that is how it's gonna go. And it's not quite the same <laughs> in my new working environment. So just understanding the nuances of communication has been a real, um, big learning curve, um, but I've really enjoyed it. I just, I feel like it's made me wiser and um, more patient in my communication style. So um, yeah, it, it, it's, it's just something that I didn't expect. That description, it almost sounds like uh, the regular architect client interactions, but on steroids where now you have to now listen to several people or whoever's involved all at once. Uh, so yeah, I could imagine the challenge there. Yeah, all of all of my clients are in house, and they all have very different working styles. So it just right. <laughs> it takes some getting used to. <laughs> That's funny. And Lorena, let's hear from you. Yeah. So uh, I'll just mention a couple of challenges going through this shift. So the first one, I think you know, it should be. Um, a little bit evident that you know I am not a part of City Lab yet, um, so that has been you know one one of the challenges. Really figuring out a way to um, make my way somehow, some way, someday. I'll just have to be patient and uh, really you know see that through. Um, like you know, some of the uh, interviewers while I was applying to get this position at the Career Institute said, if you really want to teach. Just, just get started somewhere, you know, just get started. Um, and then just trusting the process, right? That eventually if it is, if something is meant to be, I, I, I'm a very firm believer in that. If something is meant to be, it'll happen. And if it is not meant to be, you also need to be recognize that fact and, you know, um, gracefully walk away. Um, so that has been one of the challenges. Um, another one um, also is, you know, just uh, learning all of the uh, almost unending amount of uh, requirements that are part of uh, K through 12 education. Uh, at the end of the day, we're working with young adults that require a lot of a lot of support systems. So 
that um, idea or belief that I had of, you know, really having to teach them about design and we're going to work on architectural projects and I'm going to get to teach them about design thinking, interior design, et cetera, et cetera. Um, not quite uh, the way I, I, I had anticipated it would go. Um, a lot of systems had to be in place before that. And most importantly, the uh, public connection, the, the social connection, the, uh, the relationships with, uh, with the students, that had to be developed first. So I think similar to Kate, finding that um, difference, if you know how I would speak to young adults even when I was mentoring them at a firm, to now how do I create that connection with a young mind before they decide um, you know, whether they're going to perform good, well, or not at all in, in my class. So that was, it, it continues to be a challenge. I mean, especially now through, through the pandemic, but that was definitely an eye opener, but at the same time, uh, a great opportunity for them and for myself to develop those social skills that are so much needed in any profession these days, not just in architecture. Awesome. Well, thank you all. If, uh, I, if I could piggyback uh, yeah. real quick on, on what Lorena was just sure, talking about, sure. this, is a, this is a brief segue, but um, or, or digression. Yeah, uh, I actually taught, which is where I met Patricia, I taught a semester at UTA and it was the um, intro to design class. And I, it, it, Lorena, stop me if I'm misreading what, what misunderstanding what you were saying, but I went in thinking, you know, this I'm going to teach them all about design. Um, we're going to do these great projects, and we did great projects. The students were great, but it's there is such <laughs> like going in that first day thinking you're going to do something, and the reality of like, wait, they don't know how to design yet. Right. We need to get to know each other. We need to establish this fundamental level of knowledge, um, which I guess is no different than starting and pivoting or just starting a new job. Like you go in thinking you know what you're going to do and know what you are doing. And then the reality hits you on the first day. You're like, wait, there's a lot that I need to cover <laughs> before we get to that point. Right, right. And I, I actually forgot to mention, you know, the, the added challenge of, um, in a way, being an outsider, right? I am the uh, professional going into education. So there is that back and forth play between I need to adapt because I'm now part of this new culture, but at the same time, the reason why I'm there is because of what I bring. So doing that conversation, you know, in a very diplomatic and um, purposeful way was also a challenge to have, you know, my leadership recognize, well, yes, I'm now an educator, but you hired me because I bring all of these architecture and design knowledge. Yeah. Yeah, I, um, I really appreciate all of you guys sharing your experience and pivoting, um, especially, <laughs> um, you know, whenever I, I had um, Kate as a professor in studio, like just hearing about your experience in architecture. And I believe you were the first professor to even tell me what licensure was like um, at UTA um, and just your process through that, like just hearing all of your stories and knowing what your experience was like is really inspiring. And yeah, I just want to thank you all for taking the time to meet with us and to just share your experiences. Um, I do have one last question, um, if that's okay. Um, but for any students that are thinking of pivoting um, in terms of switching from architecture to a different major, um, is there any advice that you would like to give them? Just real quickly that, you know, don't be afraid to try something. Don't be afraid to explore. Yeah. That is exactly what my advice was going to be too. It's, it, you'll land on your feet. You'll figure it out. Just, you'll, you'll always regret it if you don't try. Yeah, I guess I'll, I'll add to that is, is, you know, think about what your motivations are for doing that. Because I think for a long time, I probably didn't really understand or think about what my motivating sort of factors were as I sort of like meandered through all these different things and, and trying to figure out that like, it's not that I just want to jump around from everything to everything, but like, it's that sort of like 
path of learning and especially with, with technology that's constantly changing like if you don't try to keep up with it and try to do new things like you're just going to fall behind and i think it was that sort of desire to sort of like keep abreast of what's happening in the world and to to experience different things that, that was really trying to push me more than like wanting to jump around all over the place um, and I think trying to like figure that out for yourself, like what your motivating curiosity is, is, is really important. Yeah, thanks for sharing that. Um, are there any questions um, from the audience? I'll ask all the questions. If not, that's a great place to end it with some great advice. All right, well, seeing none and hearing no objections, uh, I just wanted to once again, thank you to all of our guests for joining us, uh, AIS and NOMAS and campus students and sharing your experiences about your career paths. Very insightful and inspiring. And uh, it definitely helped me to realize that it, even though I may be pursuing architecture here in the near future, that there's several different ways that I could potentially take uh, my career moving forward. Uh, so it, it's always great to see that. So th thank you once again on behalf of uh, uh, our AIS chapter and no loss and us students here at Kappa. We really appreciate your time and hearing about your experiences. With that, uh, we could go ahead and conclude today's uh, event. And if anyone jumped on a little late, don't, uh, don't fret. We've recorded this event and it'll be posted to our YouTube channels. Uh, so keep an eye out for that. But with that, thank you, everybody. Hope you all have a great evening. Thank you again to our guests uh, and, and students. Enjoy the rest of your semester. Good luck on final reviews. Thank you. Thank you. So thank much, you. Everyone. Thank you.